We come now to today's reading, uh, which is from the book of 1 John, chapter 4, and verses 1 to 6. So if you do have your Bible, um, it would be helpful if you had that open as I read through these verses, but they should appear on the screen behind me as well. First John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Well, good morning, everyone. And it's uh, very good to see you all. And um, if we haven't met before, my name's uh, Johnny. As Peter mentioned, I'm the, the pastor and part of the leadership team here. We're very glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, I know some folks visiting uh, this morning, some folks perhaps looking around uh, churches having arrived in the city not too long ago. Um, if you are new, um, please let me encourage you not to leave without saying hello to someone, uh, unless you're really keen to leave without saying hello to someone. We know that some folks like that, and, that, and that's okay too, but we would love to get to know you a little bit during your time here with us uh, today. So please do say hello before you, you leave. We'd love to get to know you a bit better. Um, there are some folks who I think will be um, leaving for, for, in one sense, the, the, the last time as, as regular attenders here today. I know that some of our students, this is likely to be your last Sunday with us as you graduate over the course of the summer. Um, I'm not going to name names because I'm sure to miss people out when I do that, but I know that a number of folks will be leaving. You definitely leave with our love, with our prayers and our thankfulness for having had you with us as you've studied here. And having sat in your seat around 11 or 12 years ago as a student here, who left and thought I was leaving Aberdeen for good. Um, I know fine well that the relationship doesn't end here. Um, that's, that sounds more threatening than it, than it was meant to. Um, basically, we still love you as you go. Please come back and say hello um, and let us know how we can be praying for you in the months and years to come. And a thank you too to Peter um, for leading the service so far and for reading for us from 1 John chapter 4. Um, as is always the case, uh, it would be helpful to me, and I trust to you to have that open if you're able to, uh, in either a print copy or an electronic copy as we think about it together over the next few minutes. Um, but before we spend some time thinking about that together, let me pray and ask for God's help. Let's pray. The psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We ask this morning, our God and Father, that as we study your word together, we'd each please know the truth of that. You would guide our feet, you'd light our paths as we hear you speak. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, um, let me begin um, with a question for, for us this morning. If you're a Christian, what is your job when you come to church on a Sunday? If you're a Christian, what's your job when you come to church, when you gather together with other Christians uh, on a Sunday? Most of us who are Christians will be aware, I suspect, that we do, do a number of different things uh, when we gather together week by week. Uh, one of those is, is to praise God. We've been doing that together this morning, haven't we? That's part of why we gather together. We do that mainly in song and in prayer and as we listen in the quiet of our hearts to God's Word. Another job is, is to serve one another practically, and um, people do that here in Hebron in, in lots and lots of different ways, from opening the building up and, and greeting on the door at the start of the service, uh, to playing music and, and working on the audiovisuals, and we serve one another practically when we come along to church. 
Another way we serve, though, is not just with our actions, but, but with our words. That's another part of our job. On a Sunday, we speak truths from the Bible into each other's lives. We look to encourage each other as Christians to care for one another as we meet together. We each do perform quite a number of different tasks as we gather together week by week. But this morning, I want to add another job to your list of to-dos for Sunday morning. If you're a Christian, John says that one of your jobs when you come to church is this. You're to listen out for the spirit of the Antichrist coming from the pulpit. You're to listen out for the spirit of the Antichrist coming from the pulpit. That one made you sit up in your seat, didn't it? But I didn't just say it to make you sit up. I, I said it because John says it in, in 1 John chapter 4. Our, our, our passage this morning, our few verses, is all about the importance of discernment, particularly about discernment between Christian teaching that is true and Christian teaching that is false. And John says this about one kind of Christian teaching you will hear. 1 John 4 and verse 3 This is the spirit of the Antichrist. There is a kind of teaching, says John, teaching that that might even look like it has some kind of spiritual power, but which is actually deeply malevolent, which is, to use John's words, of the Antichrist. Now, that's a very strong thing to say, isn't it? So why is John so strong about that? Well, if you've been here over the past few Sunday mornings, you might remember why he's so strong. See, a group of people from within the the, the church John was writing to had declared themselves to have a, a greater kind of spiritual knowledge than other people in the church. And that apparently superior group had departed from the teaching they'd received from the apostles. And that was a problem. Obviously, it was a problem for for them in one sense. But it was a problem too because they weren't just happy to walk away themselves. They wanted to take others with them. We caught a glimpse of that a couple of weeks ago in chapter 2. We read this in verse 26. John says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So the problem for the Christians to whom John's writing isn't just that they feel weak Uh, and a bit unsure, though they do, it's that the people who've departed from the apostles' teaching are actively trying to get them to do the same thing. And that background does help us, I think, to understand the weight of of chapter 4, I think, because John's command, notice verse 1, John's command in 1 John chapter 4 is to test the spirits. And that's presumably because these two kinds of teaching might both look quite spiritual might sound as though they could be true. And so what makes the teaching that John describes as the spirit of the Antichrist quite so potent is that, to be frank, it isn't being delivered by someone with red pointy horns and a pitchfork in their hand. It might not look all that dangerous at first glance at all. Now let's think about that a bit more under our first heading this morning. Next slide, please. There we go. Super. Thank you, Michael. Don't believe every Christian teaching you hear. False prophets are real, many, and dangerous. Now, um, I wonder how it makes you feel when I use that phrase, false prophets, or when I mention something like false teaching. My guess is that for for, for some of us, it might sound quite divisive and a bit mean-spirited, as though I'm drawing unhelpful lines, because churches should be all about unity, not about calling other people out about what they believe. It maybe even sounds a bit arrogant to talk about false prophets, because for there to be false prophets, there also have to be true ones. And who are we? Who am I to judge which is which? Isn't the truly humble thing, isn't the truly Jesus-like thing, just to live and let live, to let it slide? Well, all of that would sound quite persuasive were it not for what Jesus actually says. Because Jesus is very clear that there will be people who look like the real deal, who look like Christian teachers, but whose teachings are actually quite dangerous. He told his followers to expect this. He said, beware of false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus says there will be teachers who look like you, but who've actually come to eat you. And I'm well aware that isn't a popular idea in our culture generally, is it? In our culture, what often determines whether we should listen to someone or not is, is whether they're engaging in, in, in how they communicate, perhaps whether they're sincere about what they say. But it is quite important to have a category for, for false teaching because there are things that are said by those who look like Christian teachers from p- places which hold themselves out to be Christian churches which are just not true. And that matters, not because we always want to be right for the sake of being right, but because John says that whilst that teaching might look spiritual, it is in fact the spirit of the Antichrist. And that's really serious, isn't it? And I wonder whether we have that category in our minds at all when it comes to to Christian teaching, when listening, for example, to a podcast, that we wonder, well, it might be a bit dodgy, (laughs) in its teaching, but the person who hosts it, who hosts it is really likable, and, uh, and they're funny, and they're engaging, and they've got some interesting insights. Or when we choose a, a book to read on holiday, and we know that, that that author is a bit out there, but we don't want to be too narrow when it comes to Christian things, and, and, and reading widely will only help broaden your horizons. Or perhaps more painfully, when a friend starts going along to a church which you know has radically different views about who God is, about what the good news of Jesus really is, and part of you is conflicted because you're happy they're going to church somewhere, John would have us think at the very least, treat this seriously because not all Christian teaching is of God. In fact, some of it might be actively anti-God. And that is at least part of the point of that designation, Antichrist, in 1 John 4. As I mentioned before, it's not meant to conjure up an image of people with little red horns and spiky tails. That's what it does for us, I guess. But that isn't the point he's getting across necessarily. It's of people who are anti-Christ, who are against him. And so the bottom line, I think, in what John's saying to us this morning is this. Don't believe everything you hear just because the person saying it claims to be a Christian teacher. But it is one thing to be persuaded of that. It's quite another to know how to test whether a Christian teacher is a false prophet, because not all theological differences are spirit of the Antichrist issues. It's very important to say that. We have partner churches across this city who have different views on quite a number of issues. And those different beliefs on those issues don't mean that we treat one another as anti-Christs. Joe Hall, the minister of a pastor just round the corner from us here, I studied with him for three or four years. We consider him a close friend. We don't treat one another as being anti-Christs, okay? How do we tell, therefore, whether, a spirit, uh, whether an issue is a spirit of the anti-Christ issue? Well, John gives us a helpful framework to test whether that is the case. And it's a framework with which some of us have become familiar as a culture over the past two or three years. Because since March 2020, our culture became quite familiar with a process of testing and tracing, didn't we? Uh, Testing to see if a little red line, dreaded red line came up on a stick to tell us we should isolate. And tracing, which caused some phones to randomly ping to tell us we'd been within spitting distance of someone who'd tested positive and hope to goodness they hadn't actually been spitting uh, when you've been in spitting distance of them. And I can feel some of you flinching, even as I use that phrase, test and trace. I'm sorry about that. But that is effectively what John tells his readers to do, to test and to trace. He firstly tells them to discern false teaching from true teaching by applying a Jesus test. Ask what does this teaching say about Jesus, about who he is, about what he came to do? And then he's going to tell us to trace the teaching, trace it back to its source. Is it from God or is it from the world? 
that's the rubric John has us apply, test, and trace, and so that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time together this morning. Let's look firstly at testing. Test the teaching you hear. Is it right in what it says about Jesus, verses 1 to 3? And now, if you were here last Sunday morning, and we thought together about, about the last chapter, chapter 3, which helped us to, to, to work out how we should spot genuine Christian love from a counterfeit. And we said last week that John trains us to spot a counterfeit by holding it up against the genuine article. In the same way that a, a border officer or a border cop can spot a counterfeit passport by comparing it with the real deal. It, well, John does the same thing here again. He hands us a copy of the genuine passport, verse 2, so we know it when we see it. By this you know the Spirit of God, he says. Or in other words, this is what Christian teaching should look like. And it is interesting just what feature of Christian teaching he identifies, isn't it? Verse 2, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. One hallmark of genuine Christian teaching is that it confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh. Now remember John's writing into a real life situation, and it's quite likely that, that part of the false teaching that was kind of circulating in John's day, well, it was a denial that Jesus really had come in the flesh. And it, well, it might not come as a surprise to many of us that that would be considered to be false teaching. If you find yourself visiting a church over the summertime, while well, you're on your holidays, for example, and, and, and the person leading the service mentions in the passing that, that, that Jesus was some kind of disembodied spirit, I'm guessing that, that, that quite a lot of us, whether we would call ourselves Christians or not, would well, wonder whether that's really right, whether that is what the Bible actually says. But I'll be honest and say, I'd be surprised if you were to hear that kind of teaching when you're on holiday. Because to my knowledge, Scotland isn't ten a penny with churches claiming that Jesus wasn't a real man. So it is worth asking, is, is, is John's test a bit irrelevant for us in 21st century Scotland? And the answer is, I don't think so. Because when you start digging into the letter, well, you start to see some of the reasons Jesus' humanity was such a big deal then, and why it's such a big deal today. And I wonder if you've ever tried building a domino chain. Do you know what I mean? When I, when I use the phrase domino chain, it's when you kind of line up dominoes stood on their end, one after the other. Usually you build them up only in order to knock them over because it's really satisfying to watch them tumble one after the other. Apparently, um, the, the longest ever domino chain was 15,524 dominoes long, uh, which is fairly epic. And, and the reason that it's epic is that if you've ever tried setting up a domino chain, all it takes is to knock one of them, and the whole rest of the chain goes tumbling too, which also means it's quite a frustrating thing to build a domino chain. And I think that kind of idea is why teaching about Jesus' humanity is a much, much wider issue than it first looks. Because you see, John talks about Jesus an awful lot through this letter. And again and again and again, he comes back to the issue of Jesus' death and particularly to the benefits that people receive as a result of that death. Don't just take my word for that. Trace it with me. If you've got a Bible open, look back to chapter 1, verse 7, where we read this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Or uh, we read on to chapter 2, verse 2. He, that is Jesus, is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Or chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, we read last week, that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. Just notice how much of what John says depends on Jesus being a flesh and blood human being. If Jesus wasn't a real flesh and blood person, then his blood can't have cleansed us from all sin, chapter 1, because to put it crassly, there was no blood. 
He couldn't, chapter 3, lay down his life for us if he'd never taken it up in the first place. See, the issue, I don't think, is, is the incarnation. It isn't Christmas as a standalone idea. The threat is to all that Jesus achieved by living and dying among us as fully God and fully man. It's a threat to the very heart of the Christian message. That's the kind of territory John's defending. If you knock over that one idea from Christian teaching, Jesus being a flesh and blood human being, as well as God himself, can you see how all the rest of those dominoes are knocked over? And that does mean that the kind of teaching John is calling out in 1 John, well, it is live and well in Scotland today. I remember around seven or eight years ago, there was a, a public debate took place between two church leaders in, in Edinburgh. That one of them was, was arguing that Jesus was a real person, that he really did die, and that he did so as a sacrifice for sin, for human rebellion against God. And the other church leader, who was the minister of a relatively large church in Edinburgh, denounced that position. Jesus dying to take away human sin is, in his words, ghastly theology. Now, with all due seriousness, John would place that second kind of teaching squarely within the false prophet category. Why? Well, because it's a denial of what Jesus achieved by coming in the flesh. It's a denial of the forgiveness that he offers to people who need it of the reconciliation between humanity and God that was won by him dying on the cross. So listen, if you do find yourself on holiday this summer and you're visiting another church or you're listening to a podcast this week or watching a worship service on YouTube, if you're looking for a new church, which some of our students are going to be doing over the coming months as they move away from Aberdeen, or even if you find yourself sitting in a church service here at Hebron, and you hear someone say or imply that Jesus didn't really come as a flesh and blood person, that he didn't die as a flesh and blood human being in order to take away human sin. Don't believe it. It's not true. Now, perhaps um, you're here this morning and you wouldn't describe yourself as, as a Christian, and all of that discussion about false teaching and, and antichrists might sound pretty weird for a start. I do understand that. And it might even sound like a, a bit of a, a sort of an internal conversation to, 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 to Christians, a bit of philosophical navel-gazing among Christians. Lighten up, guys. Surely it doesn't matter all that much. You're, you're arguing over something that's such a minute detail. Why are you getting so hot under the collar? Well, this is exactly why it matters. See, the good news of Jesus is that God sent his son, fully God and fully man, and that he died a criminal's death. And he did that for a reason, to pay the penalty for human wrongdoing before God, to, to, to make reconciliation between God and humanity possible. And that reconciliation is available to anyone who would trust in him. But can you see how that means that twisting or changing that good news, it isn't just an intellectual game. Any more than tweaking or changing the recipe for a life-saving medicine would be an intellectual game. It's a serious thing with serious consequences, both to Christians who might be deceived into thinking the wrong thing and to people who haven't yet believed, who, who might well reject a distorted and twisted version of the Christian faith without ever having considered the real Jesus. That's why I think John takes this issue so seriously, and it's why we have to take the issue so seriously. Test the teaching you hear. Is it correct in what it tells us about Jesus? That isn't the only kind of assessment John commands his readers to make, though, the, the, the Jesus test. He also says they should trace the teaching they hear in verses 4 to 6. And that's our final point this morning. Trace the teaching you hear. Does it come from God or from the world? Verses 4 to 6. 
Uh, now, the, the way that a lot of us receive and process news media has changed fairly radically over the past few years, uh, according to a huge poll conducted in the United States two or three uh, years ago. Uh, well over 50% of US adults now admit to or, or, or claim to get the bulk of their news information through social media. And in one sense, that should mean that people are far more up to date with world events as they're happening. We, we, we should be better informed than we've ever been. But apparently, you can't believe everything you read on social media. Who knew? And um, so when you're being bombarded with, with news updates, how do you decide whether you're going to believe a story or not? How do you make that call as you see one story after another story after another story on your news feed or your timeline? Well, one of the, the, the key indicators, I think, is the source of the story. A story that's been well-researched, uh, that cites reliable eyewitness sources on the ground, maybe written by someone who themselves is on the scene, that's at least worth listening to, isn't it? And it's probably more believable than the rambling status update that's full of typos written by the distant relation whom you haven't spoken to in 20 years, who claims to be an expert on Eastern European uh, election processes. I'm sure you love your, your second cousin twice removed, but he, he probably isn't an expert on the ins and outs of, of the election process in Eastern Europe, or in Turkey for that matter, uh, today. We often decide whether we're going to trust a piece of information to be true or not, based on the source of that information. Where does it come from? And the reason I mention that is that John's second sort of gauge, his, his benchmark of whether to believe Christian teaching, is to trace its source. Where did it come from? How did it get here? Some teaching about God can be trusted, says John, well, because it comes from God. Verse 6, we are from God, says John. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Now, the we there isn't the church John's writing to. It isn't all Christians he's speaking about. The we is John and the apostles. We saw that back in chapter 1, didn't we? It's, it's people who saw Jesus, who touched him, who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. John's saying, you can trust what we tell you as apostles because we didn't just come up with it off our own backs, but because it comes from God. We are his spokespeople. Now, um, for people in John's day, they had apostles physically walking around among them. Uh, we don't, but we do have their words. You're holding them in all likelihood right now. How do you know whether a spirit comes from God or not? Well, you know whether it comes from God or not by whether it comes through God's appointed spokespeople. If it comes from the Bible. And you can distinguish that from false teaching, says John, because false teaching has a different source. Notice that with me. Verse 5. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. See, the they there is the false teachers. It's the people who are claiming to have this sort of special spiritual knowledge. And John says, when it comes to telling you the truth about God, just notice their sources are really, really weak. They're from the world. Their audience is the world. And you can't trust that kind of source, says John. Now, what does any of that mean for us? Well, it means that when you're, you're trying to do what John would have us do, to test the spirits, to work out whether teaching is true or not, well, you can ask yourself whether a, a church's teaching, a, a preacher's teaching, a podcaster or a writer's teaching, can ask yourself whether it's tracking with, with what the Bible says, or if it's basically a spiritual-sounding version of, of our culture's worldview. Am I, for example, being called to take up a cross in order to follow Jesus. That was the repeated note as we studied through Mark's gospel as a church family months uh, over the past few months. Am I being called to follow Jesus and take up a cross as I do so? Or am I being affirmed in every kind of behavior which our culture celebrates? Trace the teaching, says John. Is it from God through his apostles? Or is it a spiritual sounding version of our culture's worldview? 
Now, none of that is to say that genuine Christian teaching is, is unattractive. It is extraordinarily attractive. It makes more sense of the world, of who we are in that world, than anything else you will hear anywhere else. Nor is it to say that if, if people communicate the Bible in a way that's incomprehensible, that they must have got it right. That isn't the case either. We want people to hear and to understand the good news of Jesus, but to hear and understand the real good news of Jesus as God has told it to us. Not a version of it that's been dreamed up to make it more palatable. So as well as testing the teaching we hear to, to see if it's about the real Jesus or not, we also want to trace it. Does it come from God or from the world? Now, I'm conscious that all of that might sound, well, it might sound a bit terrifying to some of us. That it's your job when you come to, to heaven on a Sunday morning or as you listen to a podcast or you read a book, it's your job to discern truth from error. That, that some people are going to deliberately try and lead you astray. And not only that, that the stakes involved are, are, are quite so high. But as we draw towards a close, it is just worth highlighting one verse we haven't really given much attention to so far, but is very, very important. Verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. And he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, that illustration I used earlier about knowing which kind of news story to trust or not, it might make discerning spiritual truth from error sound like it's just a case of, of being smart enough or, or knowledgeable enough or savvy enough. And the process will involve switching on our brains, thinking carefully about what we're going to believe. But it isn't something we do by ourselves. John says that the Holy Spirit, God himself, lives within Christian people. And he is greater than the world, greater than the voices that would mislead or deceive. And so as we test the spirits, we look to discern whether they're true or not by what they tell us of Jesus. As we trace the spirits, look to discern whether they're true or not by whether they accord with the Bible. Well, so too we rely on the help of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God himself, to help us discern what is right about him. And what is not? For he who is in you, Christian, is greater than he who is not. So let's be on our knees and ask him for his help to stick with him. Hey, let's do that together now. Let's, let's pray. Our God and Father, we... Thank you that though you are the God who dwells in inapproachable light, who in one sense is beyond our knowing, that you have made yourself known. You've revealed yourself to us through the scriptures and in the person of Jesus. And so we pray that you would please help each one of us as we listen to teaching in all of its guises to test it and to trace it to discern what is correct from what is false and to stick like glue to that which is true. And Lord, for any one of us here who's yet to trust in you, we pray that by your word you would please draw them to yourself, convincing of your extraordinary kindness in Jesus, the real flesh and blood Jesus who lived and died among us and convince us that it's absolutely worth owning that good news for themselves by trusting in him for forgiveness and eternal life. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.